so um, thanks, Lisa, for introducing everything. This is, um, I attended the conference last year and it was awesome. I had a really um, good time and I learned a lot. And I see some of my colleagues here um, and it's great to see them. I'm the secondary education program leader at Humboldt State University. I'm also a longtime supervisor. I'm moderating um, this uh, a keynote speaker. Um, and I, I also kind of introduced her as a person who I really believe has a lot to share with us. And I'm excited um, to introduce her as not only an esteemed faculty colleague here uh, that I work with at Humboldt State University. Um, and as is the case with many educator, Nora fills many vital roles within our community. She um, teaches Spanish at the middle school level. She's an immersion coordinator and instructional coach for her district and most recently um, became a learning specialist for our county district. Um, She's been a K-12 teacher since 1999, uh, 1997, and she was awarded Humboldt County Teacher of the Year in 2020, as well as California Teacher of the Year in 2021. Uh, she's taught and supervised in the secondary education program since 2000, and her scholarly work mostly focuses on racism and homophobia in teacher preparation, which I think really aligns with our conference goals. Nora um, is also an avid runner, and last year she met her goal of running 1,000 miles. So often when I meet with Nora, I ask her how her running is going because she tracks it throughout the year. Um, the title of Nora's keynote address is Adjusting the Lens, Examining Inequities in Post-Pandemic Schools. And please join me in welcoming her here today. Thanks so much, Heather. Very kind words, and yes, I. I kind of geek out on my running. I know it's not that much for serious runners, but a goal is a goal, whatever you can reach, right? Um, so uh, thanks again for the introduction. And before I begin, I wanna acknowledge that McKinleyville Middle School, where I teach and Humboldt State University in, are both on the unceded lands of the Weop people. And I pay my respects to elders, both past and present, as well as to the future generations, especially those who attend McKinleyville Middle School and Humboldt State. I use this statement as a commitment to continue to raise awareness and inspire further action. So even though I live and work on the Weot land, I join you today from the unceded land of the Lenape people and the Wappinger people here on the island of Manhattan. Um, so I got my credential and my um, Bachelor of Science uh, in Environmental Biology and my master's all at Humboldt State. Um, as Heather said, my focus in my master's program was on teacher preparation with an emphasis on racism and homophobia. My current work as a middle school teacher, um, I teach Spanish, I uh, am an instructional coach, and I serve as the immersion coordinator. I'm also the mom of twin teenagers who attended school in their pajamas in their bedrooms on Zoom all year as I taught other people's kids from their pajamas and rooms and beds all year. So um, I, I, um, I had that perspective, as well as teaching in the evenings at Humboldt State in the, in the teacher prep program um, with students who are apprenticing from the Sierra Nevada to, to Crescent City, um, San Diego to the coast, uh, you know, all those ways I get to have this view into California schools and, and see schools from different angles. So um, I know Lisa already, at, already mentioned where people are joining us from, but uh, so it's so cool to see all of you educators from all over the state. I'd love to see if any of you know the land that you're joining us from. Um, so if you know the ancestral lands from which you're joining, I'm going to put a chat link in here in case you don't know, because you haven't had the chance to learn that yet. Um, the native-land uh, chat is there. So lots of people from the Chumash, the Wiat, the Tongva, the uh, Patwin. Chumas, great. Look at all this Miwok. I don't even know how to say Di Gueno. Sorry if I'm saying that wrong. I'm sure I'm saying it wrong. So great. Ohlone. So great. Thanks for sharing that. I'm still learning um, all of our traditional lands, all of our uh, lands. And I arrived in New York yesterday and learned um, that Central Park is actually divided. Uh, by two ancestral lands. So that was that was great to learn. Um, so I'm really honored to be with you all in the um, in the conference building a community of supervisors for equity and justice. And I'm thrilled to be a part of all of you 
as a group of educators focused on equity and justice. And some of the sessions today look to be fabulous in relation to this. When my children were small, I had a chance to um, take a break from the classroom and I served as a university supervisor. And what I loved about it, having already taught six years of um, Spanish, was the different angle that it allowed me to, to view classroom interactions. The opportunity to see mentor teachers do what they do made me a better teacher when I went back into the classroom. And it made me a better instructor in our teacher prep program. Anytime we can study someone else's approach to doing what we do, we're provided with a unique opportunity to reflect on our own practice and um, grow. So the work I do with future teachers is largely focused on equity in the education department at Humboldt State. We've committed to making explicit our commitment to equity. We see teaching as an opportunity to change the status quo. And we do this in our lessons and our content. And we can do this in the ways that we physically set up our classrooms. We can do this the ways that we interact with students and families and colleagues. And of course, we do this with our policies and our procedures. And in sessions later today, you're gonna to get a chance to dig into culturally responsive pedagogy and anti-racist teaching strategies and other forms of disrupting, disrupting inequity in our schools. So at Humboldt, we start the credential year with a foundational class called Multicultural Issues in Education. And I teach this course. And the course looks carefully at the systemic barriers in our schools that keep students from having equal access to the curriculum. For some students, this is news, in fact, that barriers are there and that they've been in place for decades, while other students are in our program simply because some teacher in their life helped them get around the barriers that exist. We analyze how sexism, homophobia, racism, ableism, and other biases uh, based on culture, language, religion prevent students from reaching their potential. And we hope that this course serves as a hub to which all of the other courses connect. And we hope that our university supervisors understand the importance of the initial course and can support our credential students to make sense of the classroom experience through this lens. But I'll admit, I think we fall short of this goal. I know we could do a better job connecting various pieces of pre-service teacher preparation. So I like to think about teaching using an analogy of the microscope. We zoom in, we zoom out, we focus on one area, then another, and all of it to make visible what may not seem obvious to someone who's new to teaching. Well, what goes into making a good teacher? Is it the teacher preparation program, like at Humboldt State or UC Davis or Santa Cruz or Cal Poly? Is it the cooperating teacher who models best practice? Is it the support the apprentice teacher gets along the way from their university supervisor? So what is it? Is it the, is it the readiness of the pre-service teacher as they go through their apprenticeship? Well, I would wager that all of these is important, um, but the university supervisor can play a key role for the success of the apprentice. The supervisor can help make the practice of teaching visible and can help focus the lens on different aspects of the lesson. Uh, the supervisor can help interpret what the apprentice is seeing in the mentors or the cooperating teachers lesson and connect it to what they learn in the university coursework. The supervisor is an important connector between theory and practice. And although some supervision is taking place over Zoom now, much of our work of the last year was like any year before and the supervisor's role seems more necessary than ever before. So as I begin uh, to, to think about what to say to you this morning, the first thing I wanna say is thank you. Thanks to all of you for all of the work you've done over the past year and a half that was so unusual and so demanding and so unscripted. And thanks for learning the new tools that you had to learn to support apprentice teachers and thanks for working without the tools that you already knew how to use that you would find in offices or universities or schools. Um, and thanks for being a bridge between K-12 teachers, universities and our future teachers. All of us had to sacrifice in some ways, some more than others, and all of you I'm sure <laughs> deserve more than you got paid for the last year and a half of work. Um, so what I'd like to do now is give, I know this is the beginning of the conference, I'd like to give you a chance to meet in breakout rooms to just talk for about uh, three or four minutes about what you would like to learn or gather from this conference. Um, so we're gonna, Heather's gonna put you into breakout rooms. If you can make sure that everybody gets a chance to talk um, and share what they would like to take from this conference or what they're thinking about, what they're chewing on, what's marinating around after the year and a half that we've been through and how we head into the fall. I mean, and we can come back if one of you would put uh, one or two things in the chat that you're all hoping to get uh, from this from this time. Heather, if you would give uh, five minutes of a breakout room, that should give people time to get there, introduce themselves, and then dig into like a minute each of, of what they would like to get out of the conference. Policy implications. 
return to the classroom at this moment of the pandemic. Anything and everything, indeed. Concrete strategies for supervisors, great. How to give our candidates more courage, great. And approach difficult conversations, great. That ties in perfectly with lots of the workshops that I've seen, lots of the sessions. So I'm, I'm sure that you're gonna get to have some of that. Great, good. Valuing collaborative space across the state, great. Yay for brand new, Melissa, or Marissa, sorry. That's excellent. I know, never enough time in breakout rooms. Better than too much time in a breakout room, right? <laughs> You're finished talking and you have to find some awkward things to say. Good, so you can keep, uh, feel free to, to uh, join um, your, or toss your ideas in to, to mix in with the, the rest of the ideas that people are hoping to take from this, from this conference. Um, and, and I'll just I'll just continue as I can um, look back through the, the chat as we go. So, um, you know, how how should we start back when we when we go back to the classroom in the fall? I'm sure we have a million questions. Uh, for example, what are we going to hold on to that we that we learned this year that worked and that we can take forward? And what can we ditch? What can we just say that was a that was a wash? Um, some of the students have been out of the classroom for a one and a third years, two full summers. My middle school students, when they come back, will be taller than me. And uh, some will not have advanced in their learning the whole time. So we need to give deep consideration for how to meet our students as they are, the ones who show up at our door, not those who left us in March of 2020. Um, we need to let go of who they might've been and teach whoever shows up. So what does it mean to teach something to somebody? How do I do it? What goes into it? What do I measure to see if it worked? And by that, I mean, how do I know if I actually taught it? And of course, it's impossible to separate teaching from learning. I can evaluate teaching by looking at how my students fare on an assessment. Yet, if Deanna comes into my class already knowing the past tense irregular verbs with 80% accuracy, how do I know if I taught her? If Joseph comes to kindergarten already able to sight read, how does the kinder teacher know if their teaching abilities had anything to do with Joseph's reading abilities? I would argue that the results of the assessment is just one measure of my teaching. Possibly just as important are the other things that a teacher can offer outside of the content. And one such gift is the confidence that I might lend to a student until they can gain their own. One of the best teachers I ever had taught me more, much more than content. While I remembered the lessons that she taught on adolescent de development, what I remember much more deeply is that she believed in my potential. She inspired me to read and think deeply. I had already completed my undergraduate work, but she gave me confidence in myself as a learner, something that I had not yet experienced. Um, she, uh, I, I still hadn't learned that I am a good learner. But what I gained from her belief in me allowed me to bloom and go on to become a teacher who believes in her students. From spring of 2020 and all throughout last year, many teachers were reminded what it's like to learn. And for some of my colleagues, the process was unfamiliar, sort of like a distant muscle memory. For some of us, it was stressful. For some, a welcome opportunity of renewal. Pivoting to the online environment was a sudden, often jerky and bumpy ride. Some of us needed a lot of coaching while others were ready to take off. And some of my colleagues were uncomfortable to be in the role of learner again. It was especially hard for some of us to be watched by a student teacher while we fumbled and failed and tried again, and sometimes finding small successes and other times scrapping the plan completely. We learned all over again how to plan and deliver content. And I would argue that becoming a learner again can make us better teachers. Some scholars like Kevin Kumashiro have noted that crisis is necessary for learning to take place. If not crisis, then at least we can expect some discomfort. After many years of teaching in the same routine ways, reimagining the lesson via Zoom or Canvas or whatever format you had to do it in, um, last year teachers in my district alone had to use Google Classroom, Google Meet, Zoom. They had to le learn to use Class Dojo, Google Docs, Screencastify, Edpuzzle, Quizlet, Kahoot, Cami, Flipgrid, Google Slides, Google Forms, Pear Deck, Jamboard, Desmo, Zoom, et cetera. Parents had to learn Synergy and Canvas and Edlio. Supervisors undoubtedly had to use a number of tools that I don't even know about. And none of this is content. These are simply the tools needed to access the online environment. But to learn is to stretch and to grow. And when we're learners, we remember the feelings of doubt, the feelings of humility, and even overwhelm. We remember what it's like to feel unsure about ourselves, our skills, our moves. For a teacher, becoming a learner again can allow us to look inside and adjust our focus and see the process more clearly. If we can hold on to the experience of being a learner and carry it into our lessons, it will serve our students as well as our student teachers. And when we can remember what it's like to need reinsurance, we're more likely to give reassurance. 
when we can remember what it's like to not remember the next step in a procedure, we can be generous with opportunities for repetition and practice for our students and for our student teachers. My student teacher got to see a more authentic experience of the cycle of a lesson. He got to see my process of planning, of instructing, of assessing, of reteaching, or tossing the whole damn thing out the window to start over. I'm not sure he could take it all in, but for my part, I could see how I could be a better mentor in the future due to all of the uncertainty that we were going through. According to the Brazilian scholar, Paulo Freire, education should be a dialogue. Sometimes the teacher is in control, teaches from a prescripted lesson, holds all the knowledge and hands it out in a certain order. And Freire refers to this as the banking model, as in the one with the knowledge deposits the information, which is predetermined into the ignorant empty piggy bank. In this type of classroom, a student sits passively and receives what's offered. This type of lesson assumes that the students will learn what the teacher has planned. And it ignores the fact that there are always unintended lessons, hidden curriculum that, that students will take regardless of your plan. I was grateful to see this type of dialogue that Ferry mentions in classrooms in my district this year. Ferry would have been proud. In one third grade classroom, I was helping the teacher transition from Google Meet to Zoom. So as we made it all over into the Zoom meeting, the kids were asking questions in the chat and showing their pets on camera and changing their names on the screen. And the teacher was allowing the students to mess around on Zoom to get comfortable. It was then that a third grader taught us all something important. He put a funny hat on and glasses in his picture in the Zoom settings, and the teacher didn't tell him to stop. Instead, the teacher said, show us what you did there, Alex. And with this simple invitation, she refocused the class, but not on herself. She asked the student to become the teacher, to share what he knew, to teach the class. It was a simple yet profound teacher move. It was unscripted, it was student-centered, and it shifted the power and control. The teacher became the learner. The learner became the teacher. The invitation, show me what you know, allowed momentarily for the erasure of the hierarchy that seems so embedded in much of our delivery. When students feel valued and cared for, when the connection is intentional, and when humanity is more important than content, the learning is easiest. Relationship between my students and me Relationship between my content and my students and relationships between my students and my student teachers make content all more relevant. In my middle school classroom, students are required to talk to each other, in Spanish, of course. Uh, we form small groups and share about the events of the past weekend, our upcoming plans, our daily routines. And in these small ways, students reveal tiny details, which allow me to connect the content to their lives. And when I can keep the students clearly in focus, all of the other responsibilities of teaching can remain where they belong, on the outside, still in the frame, but not centered. And this focus on relationship is consistent with my Humboldt State apprentice teachers. When they see how content relates to their lives or to their future work, their motivation to learn is higher. In my class, the Multicultural Issues in Education class, students are asked to identify biases that they hold and then zoom out and see how systemic bias can prevent their students from being successful in school. When I start class with a check-in and ask how they are and ask if anyone needs anything, my students feel seen. These apprentice teachers then tell me that they're beginning to do that with their students. When we can put social and emotional health first, students can get into the lesson. If I can model for my future teachers that I care for them, they in turn can offer that to their students. This was never more important than this year during the pandemic. Student teachers were under an enormous amount of stress, and so were our students in K-12. Of course, education doesn't happen in a vacuum. Society and schools are intertwined. When we zoom out and look at the context of education and societal change, we can see that schools are still using some very outdated models. To a large extent, our public school system has not changed to keep in line with the needs of our people. In March of 2020, schools across the country sent students home for an unknown number of days or weeks or months due to COVID-19. And the months that followed were filled with uncertainty and fear. While some of us spent time developing new, new systems of lesson delivery, some focused heavily on photocopying paper and packets and forgetting that whole families were in crises. While all of this was happening in schools, the country was reeling from the murders of Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. And I was zooming in and out, trying to keep one eye on my students and their families and one eye on the nation's response to the horrific period of racial violence and to the pandemic and to the myriad issues related to school closures. Linda Darling Hammond argues that the history of inequality in US education across social and racial groups is really long. And Tyrone Howard notes that students of color and students living in poverty come to schools already at a disadvantage due to the opportunity gaps that have persisted in communities for decades. 
the pandemic has exacerbated these gaps, no doubt. How can we stop these gaps from growing wider due to campuses being closed for all of those months? Well, I'm a thoughtful and committed advocate for our public education and public schools, public teachers. I'm not a blind cheerleader. I know that public education is imperfect and in need of significant overhaul. Our public educational structure hasn't yet made good on the promise of our democratic ideals. And I'm clear eyed about the disparities in educational outcomes for our students of color, for students who live in poverty, for students who don't speak English as their first language, for students with disabilities. We need fundamental changes in formulas for funding, in curriculum, in teacher preparation, and in family involvement if we're really gonna have an equitable offering. On top of all that, in the middle of this pandemic, school's critical role in our community has never been more clear. When schools closed, important conversations began about all the ways that schools serve our communities, breakfast and lunch, physical activity, social and emotional health supports, clubs and activities, music and art, counselors, nurses, and beloved teachers were all pulled away from families. Schools offer so much more than core curriculum. And while the fight for justice raged in the streets after the media carried the images of black people being murdered, the media made little, little mention of rural families who had no access to the internet or families who had depended on meals that school provided or parents who lost jobs because schools were no longer a place for their kids to go. In the face of the pandemic, emergent bilingual students and students of color and students living in poverty will undoubtedly suffer the most due to the pivot to online education. And they fell farther behind academically than their white peers. And all of this on top of the fact that communities of color were disproportionately impacted due to the impacts of COVID. So let's adjust the lens a little bit and zoom into two of my sixth graders and see how they manage. Let's start with Aiden. Aiden lives with his mom and dad and his sister. He's white, both of his parents have white collar jobs that allow them to work from home. His father works in computer, computer technology and Aiden has had a computer since, uh, for several years. He's already somewhat computer literate. His house has stable, reliable internet. He doesn't share a bedroom with his sister who is also participating in distant learning, distance learning. He's an introvert. On Zoom, if Aiden is having a problem, one of his parents appears on screen to help. And if Aiden uh, is stuck when we're working asynchronously, one of his parents writes me an email. And Aiden tells me that he loves the online learning environment. Let's zoom in to another student, Aisha. She's also in sixth grade. She lives in a two bedroom apartment with her grandmother, her mother and her little brother. Her mother has two jobs. Both of them are out of the home. The house has limited bandwidth and Aisha has a school issued Chromebook. She's never had a computer before. She doesn't type and her grandmother doesn't use a computer. Aisha often wakes up late and misses class since no one wakes her. She misses instructions. She can't get the document open. She can't get to the right site. She doesn't ask for help when she's stuck. Aisha speaks Spanish to me and speaks Spanish at home, but she says she doesn't talk in other classes. Aisha doesn't turn her camera on. She doesn't respond when I ask if she needs help. I call home often and grandma tells me that she doesn't know how to get Aisha the help she needs. She thinks that Aisha is depressed and she's worried about her. Aisha's mom got exposed to COVID and Aisha missed two weeks of my online class falling further behind. Aisha tells me that she hates school and she misses her friends at school. Now, obviously these two students demonstrate the ways in which the online environment works out well for some students and widens the opportunity gaps for others. But what are some of the changes that one rural school can make to allow for Aisha to get the education that she deserves? And then how can we scale that up to make sure all of the Aishas make it to UC Davis or Humboldt State and get what they need there? Imagine that we invested in social workers and school psychologists and nurses in the same ways that we suddenly came up for laptops for everyone. If we believe what Kevin Kumashiro proposes that in fact learning can cause crisis and in crisis we learn, then in this time of national crisis, we must take advantage of the crisis we've been served. The time right now to learn, unlearn old ways and reimagine how we teach to bring our learners into focus. Now that we've had a fundamental disruption, how can we take advantage of that moment? How can we leap forward into a new model of education? What should we be planning for? What can we imagine? And then begin asking for. This crisis offers us an opportunity. What will you put on your list to reach for? What will you put at the top of your list to leave behind? No, really, let's start make, making our list. Talk to your colleagues, your students, your deans, build coalitions across campuses and across the country. Call your representatives right to the White House. At the top of my list are these. Provide for every child the basics, food, shelter, and the tools that they, knew, that they need to do the work, whether it's a laptop, a book, the internet, connection to the internet. Number two, build upon the small cohort models. Build collaborative learning into the little cohorts. 
Number three, budget for schools to have nurses, social workers, psychologists on staff to scoop up kids who don't have access to these social services in other ways. Number four, hang on to asynchronous work that allows students who work or care for family members to do the work on their own time and still be successful. Number five, hold on to home visits. We visited a lot of people in their home this year, a lot of students. And this simple act gives us great insight into the conditions that a student is living in. What's on your list? Feel free to put something in the chat. What do you wanna hold on to? What should we forget about? As you chat, as you think, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna keep going, but I wanna read your ideas. What should we leave behind? And what should we take with us into the new, hopefully new model? One of my goals in teacher preparation is to send future teachers out prepared to notice and disrupt the inequities that already exist in schools. In order for this to happen, they need a lot of guidance and modeling. We can't expect fresh teachers to upend years and years of systemic inequities. How can they bear the burden of the long entrenched ways that we've sat by and watched? Cooperating teachers have to be modeling best practice, culturally responsive pedagogies and anti-racist strategies, but they may not be doing that. University instructors and supervisors play a critical role in this support. Having explicit conversations with the cooperating teacher and the apprentice teacher about justice, about equity, about bias as it appears in the classroom or the textbook or in society are vital. So what I'd like to do now is give us some time to talk in breakout rooms. I want you to share about your experience with conversations around equity. Do you model it for your cooperating teacher? Do you model it for your apprentice teacher? Do you avoid the conversations? You can be honest, there's not, there's not I'm, I'm sure that there are all ways to do this. Do you model a frank and direct approach or is it more subtle? Do you slip it in into supervision? So Heather's gonna put you into breakout rooms again for five minutes, it won't be long enough, I know. Um, and then we'll come back and share out. System that's not living up to its democratic ideals. In the School of Education at Humboldt, we hope to create what Maxine Green calls the wide awake teacher. A teacher who opposes inequities in education, who understands the moral obligation to work towards justice. But all of us at Humboldt State, at Santa Cruz, at UC Davis, Cal Poly, wherever you're coming from, in all teacher preparation programs, we should be teaching students to ask for a more ethical and just society. And if we're not modeling that, we aren't advocating for this kind of society, our student teachers will know that we're not authentic. It's up to all of us to create opportunities for our student teachers to learn how to disrupt the status quo, how to disrupt the inequities that are embedded in our school systems. We need to be their interpreters and their guides. If we want change, we need to put energy and focus into the change that we want to see. It's my hope that we can learn from this crisis, that we can harness the moment and to bring real change to an outdated educational system that benefits certain people, reinforces the status quo and maintains inequality. It's my hope that from this time, we can keep our students in sharp focus at the center of what we do so that we can resist the call to go back to normal, but rather reimagine a more equitable system of education. Thanks for being here this morning. And I hope that you have uh, get everything you want out of this conference. Thank you, Heather. And thank, thank you, Laura, so much for starting our conference and, and generating a lot of ideas and, and important thoughts. Mm -hmm.